Greetings, everybody. Pastor Thomas Boer here of Heritage Reformed Presbyterian Church in Sanford, North Carolina. I wanted to give you uh, a relatively brief explanation about what a Reformed Church is. Many of you are probably at most vaguely aware of the term Reformed and its usage in churches and church history and so on. Uh, we're a very unique church among uh, American culture. Uh, Calvinistic and Reformed churches are few and far between in general, and then even those who fly by that label are often more um, broadly evangelical than actually truly Reformed, Covenantal, Calvinistic, and so on. And so I want to explain some of these terms, how they're rooted in Scripture, and God willing to give you an idea uh, of what our church will be like. And I trust that you will see it is uh, founded upon the teaching of God's Word itself and not man's imagination. To help with that, I have a book here called What is a Reformed Church? Very convenient, I know. Um, I'm going to go through the first chapter, uh, just kind of summarizing some of its points and adding my own thoughts as we go to kind of explain uh, what Heritage Reformed Presbyterian Church is. So the first chapter is called The Distinctives of a Reformed Church. And the author says that a Reformed Church reformed according to the scriptures is essentially the essence of what we're aiming for. So when you hear the word reform, but are you reforming from or reforming by? Uh, well, first and foremost, we want to be reformed, uh, fashioned into the likeness of Jesus Christ, according to his holy and inspired word. I would hope every church uh, would say that. So in other words, we're not trying to be led by uh, the Spirit of God, uh, some sort of mystical feeling or experience, but no, rather the Word of God in the Bible itself, and we trust that God the Holy Spirit will help us to understand the Word as we study the Word of God. Uh, and so we're rooted in Scripture and Scripture alone. But in the uh, 16th century, uh, you had the Protestant Reformation, 1517, Martin Luther comes, around, comes along and posts the 95 Theses on the castle door uh, and is starting to push back against the corruptions in the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And so the author of the book says in the 1500s, people first used Reformed to refer to churches that under the vigorous preaching of these early Reformed preachers separated from the corrupt Church of Rome. And that by 1520 or so, Martin Luther said, For me, the die is cast. I despise alike Roman fury and Roman favor. If you know something of your church history, you know that the Roman Catholic Church at that time was even selling uh, indulgences, that if you pay a certain amount of money, your deceased granny can get out of purgatory, the place sort of in between heaven and hell, uh, and shave thousands or millions of years off of their time there so that they can get up into heaven. Uh, and the indication, of course, there also was that salvation is achieved by good works. Uh, for the Roman Catholic, you have to be saved by faith and works, not faith alone and Christ alone. Um, now, today, uh, in evangelical churches, I, I don't think the, the common um, concern uh, is the Roman Catholic Church. In some ways, perhaps we should be more concerned, but I think in other ways, uh, the battlegrounds and battle lines have shifted quite a bit. Uh, today, we are really having to uh, weed out um, works-based righteousness in our own reform denominations and, on the other hand, uh, antinomians, those who are against God's law for the Christian. So in other words, a truly biblical church, reformed church, will understand that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, and we're reformed according to scripture alone, those five solas, those five alones, um, but that does not therefore mean that as believers we can just live for sin, live how we please, and God's law and God's commandments have no binding authority over us. They absolutely do. God's word, his law, his truth stands forever. And so as God's people, we live by his word, by his laws, by his commands, because we love him and out of glad hearts serve our Lord and Savior. Many evangelical churches today... Um, leave out the lordship of Christ, only preaching what they believe to be his um, saving grace, that he's the savior, uh, but they don't want to emphasize that he is the Lord or master who demands obedience from us. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Anybody who does not do this is not worthy of me. Uh, and so it's not that we're saved 
by our good works, but that a true faith in Christ will indeed uh, be pregnant with good works and serve the Lord from a glad heart, keeping his commandments. Well, that's more of the modern struggle and issue and battle, but going back in time to history and the sort of the origins of the Reformed movement, the Reformed faith, and so on, in the mid-1500s, the book says, the term assumed a new emphasis. It was used to identify the so-called Calvinist wing of the Reformation. And so there was Martin Luther, and then there was another camp that sort of formed, uh, largely under John Calvin. And there was much agreement other than a, a few things on the sacraments, uh, the nature of the Lord's Supper and so on. Uh, but sadly, they could not come to unanimity, unanimity on this, and so they were... Um, not entirely united in their views of the sacraments and worship and so on. But Calvin, men like Calvin and others who lived in the mid-1500s, they went much further in reforming uh, worship, church government, and practice. And so they became known as the church reformed according to the word of God. And then you go on further into the 1600s, and the word continues, reform continues to grow in its meaning, encompassing the Puritans, um, who were very thoroughgoing, expanding their teaching on law and grace and on the covenants. And the covenant is a very important uh, missing piece of, uh, it's really the heart and soul of reform teaching and theology that many people who call themselves reformed today, sadly, either have no understanding of or have really misunderstood the nature of the covenants. A covenant is, to use O. Palmer Robertson's def definition, a bond in blood, sovereignly, by God, sovereignly administered or given out. So God has made a bond with his people, his promise, his oath, in which he demands us to trust in him and follow him. And as we repent and believe in Christ for salvation and walk with him, we can know and be assured that we will be saved of our sins on that last day when Christ returns and we all face judgment because of the covenant promises of God for his people who receive him in faith as their covenant Lord. We can be assured of our salvation because we have walked with him in true faith and holiness. Well, the covenant has worked itself out. Uh, from the beginning in, in, in time, you can go all the way back to God himself covenanting to redeem a people for himself through the blood of Christ, even before the world began. But the stepping now into time, uh, if you want to put it like that, when God made Adam, he made a covenant of works with Adam before Adam and Eve had fallen into sin and said, obey me and you'll live. You know, do not eat the forbidden fruit lest you die. Well, as we know, Adam fell into sin, ate the forbidden fruit, and they were cursed. They were punished. And yet right there in Genesis 3.15 is the first uh, covenant promise uh, pointing to and showing forth the covenant of grace that God makes of his people after man had broken the covenant of works. In Adam, we are all dead in our trespasses and sins, and so we must be united savingly to Jesus Christ by faith in order to be redeemed uh, from our sin and our connection to our fallen state in and through Adam. And so the covenant of grace is proclaimed all the way back from the beginning of Scripture, Genesis 3.15, right after the fall, where it says the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent from Eve's seed. Ultimately, Jesus Christ will come, the one who will crush the work of that serpent, Satan and the serpent there in the Garden of Eden, to overcome the works of the devil, to overcome all the sinful works of man, and to redeem the lost sheep of Israel. And Israel, ultimately, now in the New Covenant era, now that Christ has come and shed his blood, uh, encompasses and includes people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. If you remember in the Old Testament, it said, uh, God said to Abraham in Genesis uh, 15 and 16 and 18 and so on, uh, that he's making a covenant with Abraham and that Abraham would be the father of many nations. And then Galatians 3 and 4, Romans 3 and 4, uh, and elsewhere in the New Testament tells us that all who are in Christ are uh, true children of Abraham. And that true seed of Abraham was Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are a true child of Abraham, a true son or daughter of Israel, regardless of whether you are of Jewish uh, bloodlines or not. And so the Reformed people, faith, people of God, we see one covenant people 
one church, Old Testament, New Testament, down through the ages. There are not two people of God, the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people. There is one people of God, the Jews and Gentiles alike, united in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, of course, in the Old Testament, God first covenanted with the nation of Israel. But now, as Romans 11 says, has grafted in Gentiles along with the Jewish people into that one church, into their one covenant head and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Christ fulfills, if you will, the covenant of works for us, where Adam failed, where we all are born fallen, already covenant breakers, having sinned against God. Uh, we, are created, uh, we are born dead in our trespasses and sins, as Ephesians 2 says, but are created again, created anew in Christ Jesus unto good works when we are born again by the power of the Spirit and receive Christ in faith. And this is all possible because Jesus Christ where Adam failed, Christ prevailed, he came to earth as a man, fully God, fully man, and as such, obeyed the Father perfectly, never sinning, never doing anything uh, wicked or even imperfect. It was perfect obedience, perfect righteousness that he offered up willingly as a man to the Father in obedience to his Father so that he could go to the cross as that spotless or that sinless righteous Lamb of God to face the wrath of the Father for the sins of all of his chosen elect covenant people, the lost sheep uh, of Israel. That's, that's what we are referring to. And so another distinctive, then, of the Reformed faith is that every person for whom Jesus died will be saved. Jesus does not fail to save those for whom he died. And that may be confusing, again, to those uh, in our nation today. Uh, the typical teaching, the same teaching that I grew up and used to understand and believe, uh, well, and it's understandable, is that, well, Jesus died for everyone and he offers salvation to everyone. Well, Jesus, in one sense, we can say, did die for everyone insofar as salvation is offered to everyone. But did Jesus actually die and atone or pay for, take away the sins of every single person? Well, no. And every church that does still affirm the realities of hell recognizes that, even if their theology is inconsistent here. And sadly, most churches are inconsistent. But the Reformed <clears throat> faith rightly looks at Scripture and says, Jesus laid down his life for his bride, his chosen people, whom he had promised and purposed, according to his covenant promises from before the foundation of the world, to redeem out of their sins and to saving spiritual union with Jesus Christ himself. And all of those people for whom Christ died, he will infallibly and certainly bring to faith by the power of his spirit, working in their hearts, giving them new life. So we're talking about being born again or the new birth. And then after being born again and no longer dead in sins, these people whom God works in their hearts in this way are now willing and glad to believe in Jesus. And so they do. They repent and believe and trust in him for salvation. And this was a really radical, life-changing position for me to understand. Uh, the, the, the Christian school I went to and most churches in our nation today teach that, well, Jesus died for everyone, but that death doesn't accomplish anything unless man himself, by his own power, by his own free will, elects God rather than God electing him because scripture speaks about God electing man but many churches today have put reverse the order and made God the one wanting man to elect him without God having any sovereign power to actually save anyone unless man first of their own free will chooses him but but scriptures say no one does good no one is righteous all have turned aside no man apart from the power of the spirit re re redeeming them regenerating them has the will or the desire, the nature, to turn to Christ for salvation. And so that means if God does not first work in our hearts and change our hearts and wills so that we want to believe in him, we never would. That's how sinful man is. And that is not because God is preventing man from coming to him, but because man's own wickedness, fallen in Adam, prevents him from coming to Christ, unless Christ had first died for them on the cross and then applies that salvation accomplished at the cross, the redemption accomplished at the cross by the Spirit in time to their hearts so that then they receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the beauty of the covenant of grace, that Christ has accomplished salvation from first to last and even has bought for us by his blood 
the work of the Spirit in our hearts, which brings us to saving faith in him. And so this is very distinctive of the Reformed faith. It humbles us. It stirs us to greater love and devotion to Jesus Christ, because the difference between heaven and hell isn't the power of my free will, but the sheer pleasure of God and his good grace in choosing to save me and redeem me from my sinful estate, to bring me out of my darkness and to bring me into faith in Christ. So that I can't pat myself on the back and say, well, my faith was a result of my free will, which I exercise better than Joe down the street who went to hell. No, I have to say, even my faith is a gift of God, as Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, and not of work so that no man may boast. And that is the glory of the gospel, which the Reformed faith upholds. The book uh, also talks about scripture alone, that we are believers in scripture alone, not, not future revelations by the Spirit, uh, or words from uh, a pope or a council. Only God's word is infallible and inerrant, without errors, without fault. That alone comes from God himself, and we can take that to the bank. To the bank. And so we trust in him, follow him, serve him as guided uh, and reformed by the word of God, scripture alone. We don't add to that. Many churches today whether the Roman Catholics looking to infallible, supposedly infallible words by the Pope added to Scripture, which often contradicts Scripture, or many evangelicals listening, listening to what they think is the whisperings of the Holy Spirit, which goes often against Scripture, or some word or some prayer or some vision that someone else had. Um, that is not uh, faithful to God's Word, though I'm sure many are well-meaning uh, in this. And we as Reformed believers... Uh, we would say that is not faithfulness to God when we listen to these spirits. First John says to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And God and has told us in Hebrews chapter 1 that in these last days that we are now living in, he has spoken to us finally by his son, Jesus Christ, according to his word. Because it is in his word that we know Jesus Christ. And the work of the spirit is not to uh, whisper sweet things into our ears today, but to help us understand God's word. Jesus says, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. He will guide you into all truth because he will take of what is mine, that is what is of Christ, and declare it or show it, reveal it to you. Well, the Spirit did give uh, revelation to the apostles and, and, and those who were called to write down the scriptures, but today the scriptures, the word of God, is complete. And so now the Spirit's work in ministry is to help us understand the Word of God as we study it and to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, as John chapter 16 tells us. That is the ongoing work of the Spirit. And so we uphold the beauty of worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth, not according to the imaginations of men. Um, as, again, going back to the origins of the Protestant Reformation, the reformers, uh, they were wanting to correct the abuses of the worship of the Roman Catholic Church with its frankly idolatrous ways of uh, bowing down to statues, uh, supposedly venerating uh, Jesus in this way, or Mariolatry, worshiping Mary. Uh, the faithful reformed churches do not have any sort of visual representations uh, of, of God, of Jesus, of, of Mary. We're not bowing down to them to serve them, as uh, the scriptures tell us, the commandments tell us not to do. Uh, even if it's said not to be idolatry, but to help us worship Jesus, uh, we say as, as Reformed believers, according to scripture, we are not to do that. Um, we are to worship in spirit and in truth, in guidance with his word, and God has not given us any depictions or images of Jesus. Uh, it's the truth of God's word, not uh, prophetic movements of the spirit or images that are in front of us that draw us closer to him, but his word, which is truth. Jesus says in John 17, sanctify them by your word, uh, by, by in your truth, your word is truth. And that is uh, what we seek to uphold above all as reformed believers, the word of God given for the people of God. Now, the book goes on and talks about that some. It says, a Reformed Church recognizes the Bible's absolute authority over all its affairs. It does not acknowledge prelacy, which is hierarchical church government. We have bishops and popes at the top, which call the shots. Uh, that's not the source of authority. Neither does it ascribe legislative power to a synod or council. We may have synods and councils, but ultimately these powers of these bodies only are under 
the Word of God, and each church, local church, retains its own functioning, its own autonomy. It's, it's still a true church. It's not dependent upon the councils to have its identity. Uh, a Reformed church emphasizes the divine sovereignty, majesty, and glory of God, and therefore the great gulf that exists between God and his transcendent holiness and man in his sin and misery, and how Jesus bridges that gap to bring us miserable sinners to the mercies of God in Christ Jesus. So it elevates God as the high and holy one, the just one, who won't wink at sin, but punishes it justly and righteously, and yet brings us wicked sinners into his saving grace sovereignly by his power through his Son and the work of his Holy Spirit. That's, in a nutshell, the Reformed faith. Now, all of this has a bearing and effect on the way we worship the Lord, and I've alluded to that a bit already. We're not worshiping through images or idols, and the real battles today, we're not worshiping as a gathering to entertain ourselves in a sort of secular, uh, rock and roll uh, concert atmosphere. That's not to say that you can't enjoy a concert or anything like that. The point is saying something else besides man-centered entertainment is going on when we are worshiping the holy and triune God. The different thing is that we are worshiping the holy and triune God. And in Christ, Hebrew says uh, that God meets with us, that we are elevated and God comes down to us in worship on the Lord's Day, on Sunday, the day of the week in which the Lord Jesus rose from the grave, when we are commanded to gather in his name as his people, God, his spirit, his presence, he is with us and we are with him and all the saints in glory in heaven in a special way on that day. So we are bringing our our service, our praise that the Lord is owed to him, especially on this day. And so our worship is geared and focused on God. It is a Godward focus. And so that is going to shape and fashion everything we do in worship. When you come to worship, how often do you think that you are meeting in a special way, in the truest way that you will this side of heaven with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he is there present with you in a way in which he is not present with you any other time. God is always with us, but there's an extra special blessing when we gather as the people of God, the temple of God, and he indwells us. He's always indwelling us, but again, as the gathered people of God, the temple of the Lord, there's a spiritual presence, an outpouring of God himself at this time, which man cannot summon, is something that he has promised to bless, and so we had better worship him according, again, to his word and not our desires, not our imaginations. Now, obviously, there's worship wars. <laughs> there's debates about what is and is not appropriate according to scripture. And I'm not trying to strain every gnat on that issue. Um, however, I, I do want to bring out very clearly that our church is so... Um, deformed <laughs> rather than reformed according to scripture in our worship that it is almost imperceptible at times whether we are there gathering to be uh, entertained or gathering to render praise to the Lord himself. Um, if you have a bunch of uh, a drum set, guitars, etc, 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 this isn't a screed against those musical instruments. You can even use these in worship. I would say, biblically and faithfully. But when this is used almost constantly to mimic the ways of the world, to bring in shallow, vapid uh, lyrics which have very little meaning, um, and to work yourself up into a frenzy that is not from the Spirit of God and the truth of God's Word, but is simply a getting worked up for the sake of getting worked up, because that's what our culture does when they go to these concerts, that is not of the Lord, that is not of the Spirit, even if we ascribe it to that, and that is um, a self-deception. Uh, it's an illusion. And so that is not an appropriate way to worship our great God in heaven. This doesn't mean that worship is apart from emotion. It is full of emotion, true emotion, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but it's according to God's word. And so at our church at Heritage, we sing the Psalms, which is God's song book, which he's given to us, which we ought to sing. And we can be sure of its theology is sound because it's from the word of God. And we sing hymns, which are based on the Psalms and rooted in the deep teachings of God's holy word. 
And so our, our, our worship at Heritage is reformed according to the Word of God, and we preach the Word of God book by book, line by line, verse by verse. Uh, many churches today, again, it's, it's sermonettes for Christianettes. It's not deep. It's shallow. It's surface level. It's emotion driven, just like the, the music portion of the service. Um, there's no liturgy. There's often no flow or rhyme or reason to it. All because we've forgotten that we're meeting with the Holy God and he has told us the proper way to render worship to him. He's not left it up to us. He's revealed how to do so in his word. And so there's a dialogue in worship that is going on. God is meeting with us. We are meeting with him. He is greeting us and uh, permitting us to come into his presence. And then we are responding with praise to him. So there's a call to worship. There's a, a benediction where the minister, I will raise my hands and say, Lord, uh, bless you and keep you or grace to you in peace. In the name of God, our Father uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a benediction, God's parting word of blessing to his people at the end of the service because there is a, um, a, a give and take, a, a conversation, if you want to put it like that, with the Lord that is taking place in worship. And so our, our worship, our liturgy, our order of worship is all structured around this understanding of Scripture. And this is rooted in uh, the Old Testament where the Israelites meet with God, uh, carried on into the New Testament, the way uh, the, the, the saints gather to worship him and hear the word of God preached and proclaimed. Uh, Jesus spoke uh, in the temple, in, the, in the, um, the synagogues, reasoning with the people from the scriptures. So the focus is on the word of God. When I say that we preach expositionally, uh, that simply means we look at the scriptures in the text in their original historical context, and we seek to bring out the biblical meaning of the text uh, from the word of God, going through the books of the Bible primarily. That means we're not going to apart from scripture, pick some topic like uh, dealing with finances or marital strife and then try to find a text to fit that idea, which can be done, a topical message from time to time like that, but predominantly we're going through books of the Bible and letting God's word apply itself. We're looking at the word of God, what it says, and then how does this first century message to the believers in the first century at that time or in the Old Testament prior to the first century, how does that relate to us today. And so our applications are driven from the text rather than trying to start with an application and find a text that can fit it. That is a bad way to go about things because you're going to end up interpreting the Bible according to your own imaginations of what um, should be said or should be applied or what the people need to hear rather than what God says, what God says they need to hear. So we start with the scriptures. We look at what it says as ministers. We teach and proclaim what it says, what it commands us to do as God's people, uh, the assurances of our pardon, of our forgiveness, uh, which we go through each Lord's Day. I have a reading of scripture from God's law. I have a prayer of confession and praise, confessing our sins, praising God for the forgiveness we have in Christ. And then I read a scripture assuring us of our pardon from sin, where Jesus, where God promises that we are forgiven of our sins. We have our Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a detailed summary of what we believe. We confess typically a chapter of that together, uh, each Lord's Day for worship to remind us of the faith that we hold together with the saints um, through all ages. And so this is all part of our worship. It's, it's heavily focused on the Word of God. It's long. It's over an hour, um, an hour and 15 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half, especially if we have Lord's Supper as we do once a month and there's a preparation uh, the week prior to the Lord's Supper to come uh, prepare our hearts and minds to receive the bread and the wine symbolizing the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And one other thing, as Reformed believers, believing the covenant of grace still includes not just believers in this great covenant, but their children. The good news is that God has a special um, incorporation uh, bringing in to his fold the children of believers as well, as infants, as babies. And so we baptize our babies, not because we're saying that they are necessarily already born again, or even that we know infallibly that without a doubt they are going to go to heaven but that God has a promise to them, that I will be the God to you and your children after you. As you know, in the Old Testament, the Israelite children, the males, on eight days, on the eighth day of their life, they were, they were circumcised as a sign of the covenant. Well, Christ has come not to kick our children out of the covenant, but 
to continue to bring them in and even with more blessings and riches. So as we raise our children in the fear and nurture of the Lord, according to his covenant promises, we believe truly and sincerely that the Lord will by his grace and for his glory, according to his promise, work in their hearts, apply the gospel proclamation that we are giving to our children in our homes, led by our fathers, um, and, and the mothers also teaching and instructing the children, the pastors preaching and teaching, and the, the, the church body nurturing the, our children, covenant children together, that God will bless these means to bring our children to salvation in him. And this again is back sovereign God and his covenant promises working in the hearts of our children to save them from their sins by giving them his Holy Spirit so that they are born again, so that they will repent and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that brought to mind one other point, which is really at the heart of many of the issues in our nation today, let alone our churches, is upholding biblical masculinity and femininity. When our church is, or when I should say our nation, is adding you know, every flavor of gender, uh, like Baskin Robbins ice cream, or we're non-binary, we don't know if we're a boy or we are a girl, the, that's downstream from the real issue. The issue is churches have lost what it means to be men and to be women. Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verses 26 and 27, tells us, In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so there is a maleness and there is a femaleness that bears the image of God. And if you are a man, a male, you are called and privileged to bear the image of God in your masculinity. If you're a woman, if you are a female, you are privileged to bear the image of God as a woman, as a female, in your femininity. We need to underscore that and um, look at the scriptures that teach on that. We need to look at the scriptures that teach on male headship in the home, uh, in the church, and in society and female uh, service and help meets to men, their, their, their husbands in the home, um, in the church, helping uh, the leadership and, and, and the whole congregation with their gifts and, and callings, and in society as well. Uh, we have largely brushed that aside because the culture doesn't like that, uh, but this goes again back to what God said after man fell, after Adam and Eve fell. Uh, Eve is told, uh, your desire will be for your husband, which really it means to be over your husband and not submit to his headship any longer. Women um, often hear that, and sadly men will, will even take it to mean that because women are uh, under the headship of their husbands, that means they are inferior in their being, in their essence. That is not the case. That is not what is being said at all. But there's different purposes. And God in the New Testament underscores this as well. He says, uh, Adam was formed first and then Eve. Eve was taken from the side or rib of Adam to be a helpmate, to be a helper. And that principle in that most intimate situation, that core uh, institution of marriage, uh, Adam and Eve, that relationship between husband and wife, man and woman, expands, extrapolates out to the church and to all communities and all society. Um, in different ways, obviously, we're not all married to each other, but the male and female relationship and dynamic uh, has to maintain these distinctives as God has ordained for us to have a healthy and strong society. And so that's something that faithful Reformed churches have taught and underscored and that Heritage Reformed hopes to continue to teach as well. And so these are some distinctives of Heritage Reformed Presbyterian Church. Um, we're a new congregation in Sanford, North Carolina. We've got several large families, including my own, with six children. Um, we've got young and old alike. We're a small church, but we're a growing church, and we'd love to have you come out and worship with us sometime. Uh, thank you for listening to this. And